Welcome to From Waste to Matter panel. Uh, I am Sofia, Sofia Visoviti. I am an architect and professor in architecture at the University of Thessaly in Greece. This session is going to discuss um, material calibration at the nanoscale. That is the production, the research and development of new materials that are dedicated to reversing climate change. They are biodegradable, they are recyclable, they are even pollution eating. Um, while this uh, very microscopic work uh, might seem, um, you know, too small to have an impact, in fact its impact is crucial because it builds a f basis for a circular economy. So we are going to uh, familiarize ourselves with a very fascinating new materiality from waste. Uh, blocks that are carbon negative, that capture carbon dioxide within their matter. Uh, mycelium, which is the root system of mushrooms. Uh, microgreen rhizomes and material salvaged metamaterial or metamatter salvaged from um, landscapes of extraction or landscapes of waste disposal. There is a set of four practices that are dedicated to reversing climate change, working from the tiny to the mega, from the nano to the terra, uh, thinking planetary and working in very, very micro scale. So let me introduce these dedicated designers. I would like to ask um, Alison Drink, CEO and founder of the uh, carbon negative, climate positive um, uh, company made of air. Welcome, Alison. <laughs> Pleased to meet you. Hi. Uh, and also Seem Caro, uh, artist and researcher, materials developer, uh, founding partner of the research collective Mycene, based in Tallinn and alumnus of the um, uh, ICA, I believe. Welcome, Seem. Um, Chiara Farinea, Head of Development um, at the uh, Institute of uh, Advanced uh, Architecture Catalonia, responsible for sustainable materials, research and development. Welcome, Chiara. And Anika and Ka Anika. Kaldoya and Carl Doyave of Studio Aime, um, a duo which is uh, between art, academia, and research development. Welcome and uh, glad to have you with us. Okay, so uh, we will have the presentations. Uh, no, starting with Alison, and then we'll have a stimulating discussion. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to start with, uh, with an analogy. A table stands on four legs, and it's stable. It's in equilibrium. A horse also stands on four legs, but it's in steady state. It is actively standing, although unconsciously. If it were to die, it would collapse. And it's under this principle that I co-founded a company called Made of Air in 2016. It's an idea that we have to start thinking of our planet as a whole system and thinking about the fragility attached to that system. 
So I want to walk you through what we're doing at Made of Air and the three kind of assumptions that we use uh, in setting up the company. So trees are made of air. I get asked a lot about the name of our company, and the question is usually, are you working in atmospherics? And the answer is, kind of. And I guess I should explain. A tree is made of air. Trees and plant life in general, uh, they get very little nu nutrients from the soil. What they're actually doing uh, is building from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They use sunlight and they use water and they form hydrocarbons, and they spit oxygen back out at us. So a tree is essentially a product of our atmosphere, and our planet is the only planet we know of that has this kind of amazing photosynthesis happening. And it's the only planet we know of that can harvest uh, materials from the air. I'd also like to mention another assumption that we work with is that we're facing an era of resource scarcity. Right now, our planet's, I, I think it's 70%, according to the IPCC, 70% of our non-ice land is under human management. So our land is highly performative. And by 2050, we're going to have cities that are going to urbanize by more than 800%. So according to Bill Gates here, what that means is we're going to have to start building a city the size of New York City every month for the next 40 years. And the question is, if we have this highly performative land that's maxed out, where are the building materials going to come from that we need to build these cities? The third assumption that we work with, we're transitioning, or we're trying to globally, to a 1.5 degree target. Uh, you can see here, this is from the IPCC, um, and you've seen several of these, uh, I'm sure. The point of this, what we draw from this, is that lowering our emissions isn't going to get us there. We're not even going to get there through land-based strategies. So you can see that our land is going to be maxed out uh, before we can do anything nature-based or completely uh, leaving nature intact. What we need are carbon negative strategies. We need negative emissions in order to reach our targets. So we have to face the fact that our cities are emitting carbon. But they could be carbon sinks. So historically, our planet has been storing carbon underground. We have this, what's called a carbon pool. And over time, we've built our cities from that carbon pool. And they're staggering cities. And in my opinion, they're overspecced. So you could imagine that the next century is about reversing that process. How can we get the CO2 that we've pumped up into the air back into the ground? Can we do it by rebuilding our cities using that CO2? You hear a lot about carbon sinks. Forests are carbon sinks, and they're effective. The issue is that when a tree starts to die and enters a microbial environment, the CO2 that's stored in the process of building the tree is going to be re-emitted into the atmosphere. So a tree is a kind of circular thing. Uh, it's great when they're alive for 100 years, but we use wood, and so we have a lot of waste streams, and those waste streams are re-emitting CO2 into our atmosphere. So Made of Air is a company that I started with my co-founder in 2016, and we propose a different value chain. What we have is a process to take wood waste and pyrolyze it into biochar. Uh, who knows what biochar is? Just going to take a quick... Okay. <laughs> so uh, biochar is a carbon removal strategy. What we do is take the wood waste, which has stored CO2 in its lifetime, Instead of letting it re-emit back into the atmosphere, we capture it, we bake it in a, a reactor, and we create a, an elemental carbon out of it. And when we do that, we stop the re-emission of CO2 going back in the atmosphere for centuries. And with this process, we take that material, that elemental carbon from the air, it's biogenic carbon, and we pair it with a bioplastic, and we sell it to manufacturers to make products. And we're aiming these products at the built environment and other manufacturing channels. 
then those products are going out into our into use, so long life, uh, long life cycles, and at the end of life, potentially, this kind of material can go back in the ground. So this is a carbon negative material. It's a, it's a way of taking carbon from the atmosphere, cycling it in use, so we can form it like a thermoplastic into panels, it can be injection molded into parts, uh, and at the end of life, this is a material that can be uh, separated at end of life and the chars can go on the ground and the polymers can be recirculated. Uh, it's, an, it's an interesting material because it stores a net two tons of CO2 from the atmosphere per ton of material. And this is how it looks to a lot of manufacturers when they're thinking about which materials to use. So in the case of a manufacturer working with aluminum, for example, making an aluminum panel, uh, they're generating 11 to 14 tons of CO2 per ton of aluminum. When we do the same process with our material, we not only take that material's emissions off the books, but we offer two tons of negative emissions for that manufacturer to play with. We've done it at scale. We're moving uh, to even bigger scales. We've been working with Audi. Uh, their incumbent material is an aluminum panel. We've replaced that with a carbon negative facade. This is the first carbon negative facade in the world. And uh, it's essentially turned a dealership which generated emissions into a carbon sink. We produce granules, so that's actually what our product looks like. They're thermoformable. Uh, and we can make them into lots of things. We're injection molding into into parts. Um, we're aiming at the building industry. This is an, uh, an industry that produces 40% of the world's emissions. And we're doing that efficiently uh, in Berlin and in the surrounding area. We work with a lot of companies. Uh, we work in different ways. We've worked with H&M for a couple years. Uh, with them, we do the work of looking into their supply chain, thinking about scope three emissions and what we can do by giving them negative emissions to work in that supply chain. We've also worked with Audi in the built environment. We're also working with BMW on cars. Um, I'd like to just propose this idea. A building is a carbon sink. And this is interesting because I know in the, in the kind of uh, emissions game around buildings, it's all about energy. But if you think about the life cycle carbons of a building, up to half of them are associated with materials. And this is a critical half. We've only got a, a, about five years to make better decisions about materials going into buildings. When we talk about energy, we've got a longer period. We have many years where we can optimize energy. We can't reverse the decisions that we have in materials. It's a front-loaded decision. So this is why uh, materials that can address embodied carbon are so important. So right now, what is the end of life of a building? Well, most of it's landfill. A lot of it's circular, uh, or we aim it to be circular. But the truth is a lot of it is landfill. We want it to be circular. We have materials, we're designing materials to be recirculated above ground. But there's one material that we want to decycle out of the system, and that's CO2. So we have to start thinking about that as a resource. We have, we cannot give up on our consumption cycles. Uh, we're not gonna make behavioral change in time. What we need are new resources to build. So the question is, how can we design buildings to store carbon? And I think that the way that we look at it is, we have no choice. So if we were to use right now the building materials that we use uh, in the next 20, 30 years, uh, we will have emitted 350 gigatons of CO2. And that's just the materials, that's not energy. And that is a killer for our carbon budget. So just thinking about that, we propose as, as a company that buildings operate differently. That instead of becoming emitters, they're decyclers that we're taking CO2 out of the air, we put it to use in long life cycles like buildings that we can then return to the ground. So, Made of Air has a vision. 
we're out to reverse climate change. It doesn't get bigger than that. Uh, we, are, we address the fact right now that we have globally uh, waste streams, there are biomass waste streams, whether they're wood waste or other biomass, and they're currently going to true waste. We have a system that doesn't valorize that waste stream, that doesn't take all the CO2 that's stored in there and convert it into a stable, inert form that won't re-emit back into the atmosphere. We are missing a huge opportunity. And so Meta Vera sits within this assumption that we as planet can do something about those resources, we can put them to work, and we can put them back in the ground. Thank you. Hi everybody, I am Seem and I'll be talking about uh, a little bit how I ended up uh, using mycelium materials and what are we doing in my scene. So my scene is a really young company founded in the beginning of 2021 and we are developing um, materials that are combining uh, mushroom mycelium and organic uh, industrial uh, waste materials, mainly from the forest and uh, timber and agricultural industry. And in the beginning, we had a focus in uh, the furniture and the interior products, but now we are directing our research more into building materials and insulation materials to be specific. And how I uh, got into the materials, the first encounter was around six years ago uh, when we built in Estonian Academy of Arts the science stage for Pied Opinion Festival. And even before that, I would uh, blame Kert and Einnika uh, for, for the first introduction with mushrooms because Mm, while I was studying in uh, the master's program, they had a studio considering that was focusing on the Eastern Estonian oil shale waste. So my project ended up uh, discovering or, or using mushrooms as the mm, uh, component, component that could like filtrate the toxins out from the soil. So during that project, I met a mushroom grower, Erki, we started to collaborate on several projects and also with this uh, science stage that we produced these large-scale wall panels. So basically throughout the summer of 2017 we turned uh, the interior architecture department uh, rooms into a production plant. So an important component in our material are the waste or, or leftovers that are uh, not currently not used, maybe not so wisely, in the forest and timber industry. And to give a little bit of context, uh, Estonia, half of Estonia's uh, territory is covered by forest. Uh, and the forest industry has a huge impact on the uh, local, uh, local economy. Mm. because it provides a lot of jobs and also it provides around 15% of added value to the economy. So Estonia is also the largest producer of wood houses, uh, which of 90% of them are exported. And this, this is a way of giving value to the wood, but we have also lots of issues around the circularity of the sector. For example, sawdust that we are using is often used for uh, heating the sawmills or it's just pressed into pellets and exported 
and also used for energy production, which uh, results in a fast CO2 release. But with our technology, uh, we can store that CO2 in materials. And we are using mycelium, which is the root-like system of uh, fungi. So the materials uh, really take form in the intersection of uh, waste and mycelium. And to run it through really, really simply, then we take mycelium and we take leftovers from uh, these industries. And the mycelium acts as a binder that uh, allows us to form the material in any kind of shape. It takes around five days to grow in a mold, uh, after which we could remove the material from the mold. So after that, it takes another five days to make it grow stronger. And uh, in the end of the process, uh, we dry the material so that the growth completely is finished and it won't have any possibility to grow any further. And as a result, we get uh, material that has amazing properties. Uh, the preliminary tests we made with, in collaboration with Tallinn Technical University have shown us that the material has comparable uh, insulation properties with the commonly used uh, glass and rock wool. It's also pretty strong. Uh, it has sound absorbing qualities and not to mention the um, the biodegradability, or actually it's, it's even better, it's compostable. And as we don't use any clues or chemicals to bind the material, uh, it is completely safe for also interior uh, use. So concerning the installation that we made for TAP, uh, I hope you've all seen it already, we wanted to showcase the materials uh, or, or the fungi's duality. On one hand, uh, the material could be seen as a decomposer in the nature. It uh, takes the dead matter and decomposes it. But at the same time, you can see the process also as a um, as a point of uh, new life, because the fungi makes the dead matter into nutrients for new plants and, and new organisms. So in, in our installation, we tried to showcase this by using uh, a element that uh, throughout the exhibition will grow, um, showing the materiality's way of uh, being alive and at the same time using the same material in an already stopped or, or inert way. And uh, yeah, currently we are really uh, focusing on the new research path that we are trying to uh, like kickstart. We're, uh, we're putting together a research grant application and coupling this with some investments that we could further develop the insulation material uh, as, a, as a product and, and which could lead us to uh, a point where we could use this material in the near future as a, real, a reality, not just as a concept. So um, I would also like to use this platform to reach out if, if anybody's interested in, in collaborating. So yeah, thanks, that's all from me. Good morning. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, so I'm Chiara Farinea. I work at the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, and I develop their uh, research projects, mainly funded by the European Commission. And uh, in these projects, we, we work on the environment, on food production, and on cooperative environments. So this means uh, what we can extract from nature, how can we generate cooperative environments and enhance the coexistence between the nature, the humans, flora, fauna, animals, through the design and the technology on the other side. So I'm going to, to show you our vision, let's say, through three projects. One of them is the one that you can see here in the, um, in the Biennale, which will be the last one. I will start with the project, uh, a series of projects, let's say a group of projects uh, working uh, with uh, energy production, so biophotovoltaic energy. What does it mean? It means that we extract some energy from the plants. The plants, uh, um, near to the roots, there are some, um, let's say, bacteria that are producing energy, and this energy can be harvested by introducing an anode the cathode, so two electrodes. Um, the quantity of energy that we can extract is uh, not that much, but it's enough to uh, maintain uh, sensors and irrigation system of a green wall. Therefore, our, our objective is to create projects to integrate nature in cities, which can be... Um, self-sufficient at least, uh, as maintaining city, nature in cities is hard, like there is the heat island effect, uh, is not the same for a plant to live in a forest or living in a city, um, and therefore we need some uh, like extra maintenance, and we try to reach a balance. On the other side, we create projects that are uh, working on the microclimate. As I was saying, the microclimate for a plant is not ideal in a city. Therefore, we try to use the materials uh, of the projects and uh, the, the shape uh, to create microclimate, optimize like the uh, evaporation of the water around them, for example, or investing the more water as possible. So through these projects, what we try to do is to reintroduce the nature in cities on one side, and on the other side to try to extract from the nature um, more than what we are used to. So to create, for example, in this project, as I was saying, energy. Here we have another prototype. And here we have the vision of its implementation. Still, in the next slides, if I'm able to, uh, I will show you other images of further projects that we developed with the same concept to implement the nature in cities. So uh, in this case, we were changing the, the molding system with a 3D printed 3D printed system that is uh, um, helping us with the, with the maintenance, uh, the operations of maintenance of the plants that are not anymore in a hole but in an entire pot. And here still you can see the system of the sensors in the last image to maintain the plants. We donated this project to a garden near Ayac in Poble Nou in Barcelona, and the group of citizens uh, is uh, uh, taking care of it and experimenting with it. Still from this same project we develop concept, we develop another wall uh, that has been co-designed with another group of citizens from the Poble Nou uh, in order to better answer to the, to the uh, needs of the area. So uh, one of the great things uh, of digital manufacturing uh, is that we create, can create uh, pieces that are one different from the other. So we can easily respond to the needs of the local conditions and on the other side to re the request uh, of groups of citizens uh, with which we co-design our part of our projects or uh, in almost every project we try our best to involve uh, citizens and to, and to create the projects together. In this case, they were also asking us, for example, to introduce the board's houses, uh, the insects hotel, uh, the bat houses that are that small one uh, on the top of it, uh, and, and to work more on nature. 
and also to create some textures that could be uh, used for the um, uh, further renaturalization, like moss that could colonize the project. Uh, here, the second project I wanted to show you, it's uh, also working uh, with mycelium uh, as the previous project uh, presented by Sim. Um, in our project, we created a system to cultivate the moss in the city and with the citizens again. And on the other side, uh, in the inside the structure, we are producing uh, uh, panels for isolation. Uh, with the, the mycelium uh, that was and the roots of the uh, of the mushroom that were explained before, and uh, here we were implementing also some nature to narrow down uh, uh, like um, herbs and other kind of plants to narrow down the heat island effect, and here is the final result to be implemented in uh, uh, in the cities uh, and uh, this is the panel, uh, uh, isolating panel that we produce inside. Uh, and finally, well, some more images and finally the, uh, the project that we have implemented here in the, uh, in the Biennale um, uh, that is working uh, still on the same concept of making the most out of the nature, like exploiting some hidden sites like the, the energy, or in this case, the roots. Normally, we have the roots in the soil. Uh, however, inspired by the work of the artist Diana Schroeder, we thought, why to not try to create with the roots uh, some uh, building materials? Uh, so we were developing textiles uh, for um, shading. So in the previous one, in the previous slide, you can see our very, very first test. Then we were improving our way, that is the second image. Then we were improving our way of creating uh, uh, these um, uh, membranes. Uh, here you can see the mold. So basically, uh, we are growing, uh, we are creating a mold with digital manufacturing and machines, CNC machines, or 3D printing in the case of the blue one. Uh, we are creating the mold, we are creating some some little channels, and on the top of it, we are planting some uh, plants that can be uh, used for food production, and uh, the roots, uh, and um, as a substrate, we were testing both the um, soil and also the hydrogel. Um, and uh, so basically, you, you have the... Um, the mold, then uh, a sort of net, that is the white one that you can see below in the first image below the, um, uh, the root membrane. And then on the top of it, we put the, the substrate to grow the, uh, the plants and the seeds. And actually, uh, in four days from the seeds, we were getting the, uh, the membranes that you can see there. The small one is also in the, in the Biennale. You can also touch it. And uh, uh, here, there are the, the design that we developed for the... Um, there is the design that we developed for the um, Biennale. We were testing like three different densities in order to create a shading system that can be applied to different conditions where it's needed more shading, where it's needed uh, less shading in a, in a building. So this is the, like the vision of how to apply uh, it on, the, um, uh, on, a, on a building. Uh, the material, the idea behind is to grow the material from soil and then to have its like cycle in the, in the building, actually behind the glass because it has to be protected from the, um, from the water. And then when it ends its uh, life cycle, it can go back to the, to the soil and come back to, to be a nutrient and start uh, the cycle again. So thanks a lot for hearing me. Hello everyone, uh, we are a collective called Studio Aina, that means Studio Matter or Subjects in Estonian. And we have been working with local residual and bio-based materials for about five years now. Uh, and separately, even longer. 
In our practice, the empirical methods and sensorial approach are essential. We value being close to the research object from a human and personal perspective. And while exploring the materials, we usually simultaneously research the probable practical solutions, working together with experts, companies, and institutions. On the screen, you can see a photo of our previous project in which we dealt with the largest waste group in Estonia, uh, oil shale ash. For Tallinn Architecture Biennale, we decided to look into the waste streams of Tallinn. Tallinn is a medieval town where waste has been organized since the 13th century, when it was mostly collected into cesspits. Cesspits were containers from, for excrements and household waste, and were located under the floor of the building or outside in the yard. Cesspits were emptied approximately once during a person's lifetime. As archaeological finds, cesspits are very valuable because they help make sense of life in a medieval city. While all organic compounds have decayed, the bits and pieces of ceramics tell us a lot about the food culture and material technologies of those times. Compared to the Middle Ages, the waste economy has naturally taken a long step further from cesspits, but holistic, sustainable urban metabolism is still to be developed. The most important waste treatment centers in Tallinn are, in Tallinn area, are Palyasara Waste Water Treatment Plant, Iru Thermal Power Plant, Tallinn Waste Recovery Center, and Vau Limestone Quarry. Mixed municipal waste is largely recycled or incinerated in thermal power plants. Waste from construction sites is mostly taken to Vau Quarry as a refill. In recent years, domestic water treatment sludge has formed the largest type of biodegradable waste in Estonia. After processing, the sludge is mixed with peat and made into a compost. Although the possibilities for that are limited due to certification requirements and lack of alternative usages, Large quantities also mean that some of the waste ends up in the landfill. In our study, Metamata, we delve into the philosophy and history of waste as matter out of place and a valuable cultural layer in the metabolism of the city of Tallinn. We have chosen the gypsum board waste and wastewater sludge to speculate and experiment with, which in a way are both unpleasant yet intriguing materials hidden away from the direct contact with the inhabitant of the city. Gypsum board mostly consists of gypsum with front and back paper liners, containing a small, small percentage of non-gypsum additives. Even though in one way or another most of us have experience with using gypsum boards, it is interesting to take a closer look into the composition of the material. Gypsum is a common soft sulfate mineral, but what makes it exception, exceptional is that it can be endlessly recycled. In order to reuse the board, it has to be dried in certain temperatures and separated from the paper. This is necessary if it's made into a new gypsum board, but also in other cases, because in landfill, the combination of paper, gypsum, and organic substances can extract toxic gases. In the process of working with the material, we became experts on how to cut, construct, demolish, reshape, and reuse this material. Through our experiments and parallel research in the material, we took a direction towards using it in the context of food. What are the future perspectives of extracting the edible part from gypsum board, and how it could be useful for the environment in the face of material scarcity, rising population, and shrinkage of the farmable lands? Here is documentation of an experiment that took about one month. The boards were demolished and left to set with water. During one month, the so to say dough became a solid form of a bowl. Okay, I will take on from here and, uh, and um, uh, continue introducing the processes and, and proposals of the project. Uh, which in fact we see rather as a beginning uh, than an, a final outcome. 
So as gypsum contains uh, calcium and sulfur, both of which are essential um, plant nutrients, uh, adding it to the soil can, uh, can promote better root development, uh, build the soil structure, and provide better water storage and drainage. So through different uh, chemical and mechanical processes it is, and synthesis, it is possible to turn gypsum board waste into an environmentally sustainable fertilizer, uh, especially in combination with our other uh, material in focus, which is uh, the sludge. And this proposition could influence our food supplies in the future and decrease the use of synthetic um, organophosphorus compounds at least in some areas. Uh, simultaneously with, uh, with mixing the, the fertilizer-like material, um, we continued another experiment, uh, wondering what if we add heat to the same material combination. Uh, so after meticulously forming the gypsum board waste into tiles, uh, we placed them um, into a kiln and added high temperatures up to 1080 degrees. Um, and we were stunned to see that um, uh, through that method, uh, a ceramic tile uh, came out of the fire. So through adding this layer of treatment, the material changed immediately and quite drastically. Also the properties and the uh, sensorial and emotional connotations and the value of it might have changed. Um, as a next step, we did add different glazing to the tiles uh, to add some somewhat um, practical value to the material making it less porous and perhaps even, even usable. So we added sewage large as a glazing. Um, in some case, uh, besides large, also peat and uh, the oil shale ash that we've been working on uh, previously. So the material that is in every normal situation hidden uh, under plaster or paint or another layer of decorative paper uh, becomes suddenly maybe worthy to display. Um, and meaning both the gypsum board as well as the, the sewage waste. Um, yeah, so um, as you can see, our work has evolved through experiments and craftsmanship, historical mining and, um, and cultural narratives and new materials and scenarios were created for matter out of place. Um, and by adding temperatures to the, to the material, its perception has shifted from, from something like rejected matter towards maybe a speculative exclusive value. So in a way, we had reached to where we started. Um, the cesspits with pieces of pottery, fragments that could reveal important information from the past. Now we had created new fragments from contemporary waste from housing, uh, looking through those pieces, what could be possible maybe in the future. And um, our journey of, of Metamat at that point had to stop. And we're looking forward to seeing uh, what kind of dialogues it, it could provoke in the, in the context of, uh, of material affairs uh, in the future and what could be the next steps. Uh, I will finish our presentation with, with a beautiful scene that we both witnessed a few days ago. Um, after we had set up our installation um, at the Solalado, um, there was some material left over that we had to put in the rubbish container. A day later, uh, we were happy to see that the scrap found a new function uh, when a builder used them as a support structure for maintenance work and they fit in the size perfectly <laughs> and found a new perspective in a, in a slightly different context. Uh, so this was our exploration of, of, of those two, uh, two matters um, and it was specially made for this exhibition. So we have never worked with this before and we're looking forward to uh, what's going to be the next material we work with. We would like to thank the construction sites who provided us the leftover uh, drywall pieces and, uh, and Tallinna Vesi who educated us about the sewage treatment and, and offered the raw material to work with, which, which was terribly unpleasant to work with. And Jus Heinsalu who um, consulted us with working on ceramics and of course Lydia Andretti who invited us and provoked us to, to make um, this special work for the exhibition Brick to Soil uh, section. Thank you.
Thank you all for these um, fascinating presentations. You know, we, we should consider these works, the value of these works, um, as design innovation on the one hand, and of course on the other as environmental ethics. So in this sense, um, the value of garbage appears to fit or claim an alternative economic paradigm based on economies of care, salvaging, scavenging, collaborating with uh, craftsmen. Um, your last photo of finding a very humble life, second and third life cycle. While on the other hand, it seems to adapt very well to uh, you know, economies of excess. Like Alison said, we don't need to change our lifestyle, our diet, or our habits. We only need to change our resources. So it seems to be that either way, we can find uh, a way to, to you know, restart an economy that is cyclical. Um, so that is the first, um, the first important point to consider here. So it's not a matter of choice, it's a matter of uh, capacities at many levels and different economic paradigms. The other uh, ways, like, uh, you know, design innovation. First of all, we have a new field uh, for architects, artists, designers to engage in, which is the nanoscale of material design, which is something that it's quite uh, recent. I mean, it's a, a new field of uh, investigation for architects and designers. Um, would you say that we now have the technology to produce an architectural system that is able to, um, uh, to, to be animated and to live a full cycle of life and death uh, and to eventually decompose, uh, decompose and compose itself? This is one open question. It seems to me that in fragments and very little parts, you're all working in the same direction. And this is a very wisely set up panel. Um, perhaps in combination of all, we could envision a system. Now, um, for starters, maybe it would be nice to have a reaction of yours on this first statement and then come back to some more important questions that are specific to your projects. So, um, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. Um, we are working in different countries, in different places, but of course it's a global trend to be looking for these new alternative uh, solutions to materials in architecture and design. And uh, uh, you mentioned uh, nanoscale, which um, has been around for a while, and it's an important tool for archaeologists, as mentioned in our project uh, who are working with these discoveries from test pits, but uh, also in the Academy of Arts there are new um, ventures on how to make materials in nanoscale. Uh, but the interesting fact about it is that uh, a few years ago we compiled an exhibition where we showed uh, local material developments from designers, architects, um, uh, institutions, companies, and uh, nanoscale was around already centuries ago. It just people didn't know how to analyze it, for example, in making uh, tools from uh, steel and iron. And only now we have the technology to really look um, into the scale to understand it. So uh, it, it has been definitely around for, for some time, but now with the technology evolving, we have the possibility to take it further on. 
Yeah, continuing maybe from the exhibition that we at that time uh, compiled, which brought together people from from labs and from uh, yeah, artist studios. It was um, a good start for a dialogue between these different uh, uh, researchers, and we we see the effect of it now how collaborative projects start to evolve, which brings the this little. Um, um, uh, uh, contemplations at the studio or little experiments on a smaller scale um, scalable into bigger uh, bigger um, solutions um, from our point of view I think we we try to use the um, surfaces of the city that are normally not used or used only to protect the activities that are inside the building to be part of this cycle. So to, to work with the scale of the city, but in a, pro, in a productive level, let's say, in a productive way, try to use the, um, the horizontal and the vertical part of the city to produce something. And to do this, uh, we need to go to a smaller scale, that is the scale of the plant, of the need of the plant, needs of the plant, and the scale of the production of the product. So we try to work on, the, on these different levels to reintegrate uh, a sort of production and to make the most uh, out of the, of the city through the design and as I was telling also we try to use new technologies like for example the biophotovoltaic system that I was mentioning and also the, the digital manufacturing. Yeah, uh, we, can, we can see a lot of uh, new technologies and materials that would be, I don't know, in some case like ready to apply in architecture, but uh, we also, that are also ready to be scalable products. But I think one problem uh, with this is that the uh, market is not ready yet because the uh, the currently dominating materials um, that have been like developed over like 50 or, 60 or even more years have are like uh, much more cheaper, which is the main reason for today's uh, customers uh, for for buying something. But this will, but see this will be changing because we're in a, like a transitional period. And uh, as the regulations will have an effect in like 2030, we have to, in the EU, reduce all the emissions by 50% and by 2055, everything has to be net zero. Then these are like uh, really strong uh, points that will be uh, making the future material use, uh, not only considering the price and function, but also the CO2 footprint, and I'm not saying the CO2 footprint isn't, it's not the only aspect of a material that we should consider, but uh, uh, yeah, I think it's just about how can we now like scale all these uh, new technologies and materials. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think there's uh I think there's a lot going on between all of our projects and one of the things that's that that we're grappling with right now is this idea of permanence so what we do as biological materials is question the the long life cycles needed to be able to make a building for example we have in our society the idea that a building should last 20 to 50 years we have insurance on building products that are meant to be stable from 20 to 50 years. We don't have a paradigm of biodegradable buildings. Uh, we have that in consumer products, which has been kind of amazing, seeing biodegradability come forward. And when I think we could speculate how that could work in buildings, um, I think what what what, would it, what what are we changing here? I mean the. We spent the last 60 years in a fossil economy. Materials are cheap. They're coming from below ground. Resources were easy. This transition is all about switching our resources, finding new, new sources. Things are gonna be expensive for a while before we get there. I think when I was talking about behavioral changes and consumption cycles, 
I think what becomes really interesting is that we don't have a lot of time. We can make behavioral changes, but we don't have a lot of time to do them. And one example that I always like to, to think about is the recent example with plastic drinking straws. This is a big topic. So, you know, we, uh, we as a society just ruled out plastic drinking straws in the last three years. And what we got instead is a paper straw. And who else hates the paper straw? This is a terrible product. <laughs> But my point is that we accept it because we know it's the right thing to do. We can make societal changes. Um, but we just need to grapple with the idea that a product can be good enough. And I think that's really difficult with our current paradigm. We've built, a, we've built processes around fossil economy that are cheap and easy, and everything is over spec We have materials that last way longer than they need to for their use cycles. And in the case of the paper drinking straw, it lasts a little under. <laughs> But I think we accept it, this idea of good enough Um, I think would be a, a strong uh, case to bring into the built environment. Good enough and uh, sufficiency with the minimum necessary should be our criterion of judging them rather than the optimum. Um, you know, staging Uh, carbon neutral products as luxury or as necessity? That would be one question. And then uh, if we, you know, having, looking at your um, work environments, we could say that, of course, art is the primary medium of expression and then the, the lab is the uh, place of development, but then really the, the industry is the catalyst. And Alison, you have uh, this tremendous entrepreneurial energy in your uh, uh, promotion and your collaborations. So coming back to you once again, bouncing back, uh, would you like to describe your, um, the reception of these ideas uh, with the uh, car industry, your collaborations with Audi and BMW? And I want to drop in the term greenwashing So we'd like you to uh, consider that in your other answer, please. Absolutely. Um, it, it's been a very interesting time. We're having a lot of conversations about this. I think the, when it came to the car industry, and, and indeed the car industry is not different than a lot of industries when it comes to this, um, the conversation starts with, with an, a life cycle assessment in, in our product. We don't start the conversation with a, with a marketing or a branding message. Uh, what we're delivering is data. And I can tell you that in the case of very large companies that are working in very large uh, supply chains that are trying to transition to net zero and finding it very difficult, it's the data that matters. Um, so when we work with the car industry, the most valuable thing we give them is negative emissions. And how that works in a supply chain is, everything they're working with is creating emissions. In order to get net, net zero, they need a negative emissions. And that's the conversation. I think the, if, I, if we were to talk about greenwashing, it would be, it would be, uh, the marketing message would be far lower. I think the impact that they're looking for has to come in a verified third-party audited LCA that we can deliver to them. So it does become a very, black and white discussion. Right. Um, so data will uh, persuade us of the objectivity of uh, data evaluation. Well, um, I will uh, now ask a question to Sim. So the installation that uh, is presently at the Estonian Museum of Architecture on the second floor, it is a you know a partition wall or interior partition wall that has acoustic properties, and at the same time a sample of maturing the uh, compound of sawdust and mycelium within a pit. 
Uh, and you mentioned that this has a, you know, a life cycle, so uh, it lives and then it decomposes. So one uh, term I would like to address is the idea of a living wall, which 10 years ago was a most innovative uh, uh, convergence of uh, environmental design, landscape architecture, and a new architectural field of intervention. So, would you describe mycelium as a, a new aesthetics of decay that are, you know, transforming the idea of the living wall? And plus, in your Instagram account, we've seen uh, panels of mycelium, uh, um, you know, decay patterns that are in their minimalist uh, appearance uh, commodities themselves, like you, you you can buy one and place it over your desktop. So what exactly is happening here? Is it a living wall or a decaying wall? Is it about the aesthetics of decay that we have to change our habits of perception? Or is it you know, the facts that Alison mentioned that you know, it's purifying the air, it's sound insulating, it's decomposable and that should be enough? Yeah, you put it in a really nice way. Uh, I think the aesthetics of it is, a w in a way, fitting in our, I don't know, current uh, environment where, I don't know, I would say the main like ruling aesthetics that we so far have seen has been just like uh, uh, smooth and 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 polished surfaces that we so much like. Uh, Priority, priority size, uh, because, and I, I think it's also about the, the way that we think that the environment should act, that it should be, uh, like, uh, I don't know, should be ageless, or or it should be un, or decom, like it can't, it can't decompose. It have to be somehow uh, endless life, or or. But but this is wrong, actually, as we see that we we can't build things that are gonna withstand like 100 or 300 years, or or they could if we find a, a nice way to use them. But a lot of materials uh, are just too complex to for the environment to decompose, and also they might be toxic. But in a way, mycelium. Um, as you said, explains or brings out uh, the way that we maybe should uh, pursue the way of, of using materials that are more um, aligned with the real life cycle, that if we grow something, we have to decompose something. So I think it's a, it has a nice visual message as well besides everything else it, it does as a material. Do you know, perhaps it's too early to tell, um, what is the lifespan of such a partition wall? Do we know when it will decompose? If will it flower? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it's, it's, uh, if it's in an interior context, uh, with a controlled climate and so on, I think the, it will withstand years and years because nothing really uh, harms it. Uh, but if you take it outside, uh, the untreated material, in that case, other organisms start to decompose the material eventually. But yeah, we've been using some products ourselves, like for uh, three or four years in a like a home environment, and you can see they're still acting as they should. So coming back to Kiara, um, you know, in this context we're discussing, it seems that processes, design-wise, processes are more important than objects. Yet in your case, you know, form and geometry are still, you know, very present and very heroic. Um, 
So, um, would you like to expand on the importance of form? So, you know, correlating with that sense of aesthetics. Um, and the processes that you use. We discussed a lot about um, microgreen roots yesterday. So maybe that's part of the process to explain how it's an auto-generated um, artifact. So please enlighten us a little more. Okay. With regards to the aesthetics, yes, actually we... No, it's work. So with regards to the aesthetic, um, yeah, we, we make an effort to try to have an aesthetic uh, that is uh, um, still a sort of solid aesthetic, like um, using several lines uh, and what we are used to, um, to see, to, to create with our eyes a, a clear, that our eyes is perceive a clear image uh, and uh, and that's an effort we try to do in every in every project uh, that that and I think is probably clear for my from my presentation so with regard to the aesthetic yes we try to 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 maintain a sort of solid uh, aesthetic partition between the elements and so on uh, because somehow I find it comforting to have a, an aesthetic that is clear in the city and is perceivable and the eye is used to, uh, uh, to, to see and perceive grids uh, and, and this is also orientating uh, people and also people like me that has a lot of vertigo and this is like uh, um, creating a clear image of the city. However, in each element, uh, because all our projects are created by um, several elements that are in a rigid grid uh, that is also helping to simplify the construction method and so on apart the, the, the pure aesthetical uh, part then inside each element we try to create something that has a different approach uh, and the approach is like creating something that really helps the plants to grow and the creation of a microclimate so we have our uh, sort of little machine, let's say, to create a, a microclimate there. Um, and um, um, so try to put something new or done with, with uh, uh, using a, uh, a very performative approach uh, in, in, a, in a simplified way distributed in the city through modules, very, very repetitive. And the other question was about uh, uh, the process. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, we work. We work. So we work on all the all the parts of the process. But the most difficult part, uh, uh, according to my experience, that is already more than ten years working with plants, uh, is to maintain the plants alive. Because the plants, if they are in nature, they are happy and, and I mean they are part of an ecosystem and the ecosystem is contributing in all its part to the survival of each part of that ecosystem. If you extrapolate the plant from its ecosystem, the plant start to have a lot of problems, issues, uh, is exposed to pollutants, uh, to uh, too much sun, and effect, and so on and so forth. So if we want to try to recreate a natural environment, all the parts of the city needs to contribute to this, uh, to this natural, uh, to, to the renaturalization of the city. And this means not only planting a plant, but really reflect on the materials that we are used, which are the effects, uh, the transpiration, uh, the, the uh, moss keeping, uh, leaving it during the, during the day um, for evaporation and creation of humidity that is helping the microclimate of the city. So the most part of the process is dedicated to create like a sort of machine again to make the, the, uh, the plants uh, living in the city. And then the rest of the process is dedicated to creating the most uh, out uh, of this uh, coexistence. So creating also building materials, uh, uh, making a productive city, creating the, um, the food, uh, the energy, and uh, uh, etc. So we, we address the, the different steps. Uh, so 
as, as part of the process. Coming back, because we are sort of time, um, Anika and Kart, I was humbled by your presentation, by the sensitivity of looking into the landscapes of extraction, of waste disposal, but also the archaeology of uh, Estonia. And I was very much struck by this last diagram of the um, ceramic vessels that are coming from the history of your place, and then the idea of the fragment that fills in. So this is an aesthetics of repair, and a, also fits very much to a model of economies of care. That it's your, a very small contribution. Uh, it's formless also, which is very interesting. Uh, and it, at the same time, it uh, is very artful. So the first photograph you started with that kind of reminded me of a Caspar David Friedrich landscape. You know, a man with his back turned, maybe it was a woman. And then that's a, you know, an extraction site, a former quarry or a waste disposal. So, you know, art is the mediator. It is, you know, a new awareness and a new cognition and appreciation of the direction. I think it adds value and it's not really a question, but, you know, I, if you would like to add something to that about your work before we open uh, the podium to the audience for a few questions. Yeah, during our previous projects, we have collaborated also a lot with art artists. And uh, I'm maybe more than Anika, I'm active also in the art scene and working in between different disciplines. So in a way, it is a, it's, it's like a luxury or a privilege to be able to work in this middle section and to work with these fragments and and uh, through the through these fragments, m maybe have a little view into the future, um, uh, imagining something into a material, something that maybe is not necessarily possible at the very moment, but could be very big or um, a big actor in the future. Um, yeah, and you mentioned the image, the first image that we showed. It was very important for us uh, while we were working at the <clears throat> at the uh, at the oil shale ash, uh, how is it called? It's the field, let's say field. Um, the feeling of being there, it, it's something extremely beautiful, but then it's very painful at the same time. And uh, the person on the image actually was someone who's working there um, on every on daily basis, and who so. Um, nicely opened his view on the material that we were looking from a completely different uh, point of view. Because he was a person who is actually taking care of this landscape. Yeah, sir. Time to address um, the audience. So if there are comments, questions, Appraisals, yes. Um, we have a question there. <coughs> Hi. Um, you were talking about the. You wonder, I'm sorry, bad names. Uh, you were talking about the the, um, the paper straw. How we all uh, depicted like the. The plastic ones, and it's a good enough solution, and it's uh, decomposing prior to its real end of use. So the end of life is before the end of use. Um, but when we speak about architecture, we speak about something that is related to our, uh, let's say, identity, and it's like deep-rooted psychology. Uh, so this idea of living in a decomposing uh, environment, I'm just curious: Have you? 
what, what is your statement or what is your thoughts about this idea of um, not living in a permanent house, so that your roof is decomposing or your exterior house, uh, walls are decomposing? I mean, I can imagine all sorts of futuristic proposals of maybe going back to nomadic life, but even our hyper capitalist uh, nomadic life are actually all based upon the idea that the built environment is, is constant. And uh, so I, don't know, I was wondering about this. What is your uh, prospect, the psychological impacts and cultural impacts about decomposition? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of speculation there. I think, um, I think what resonates with me is this, is this shift. So I, I deal more on a microscopic level, as we talked about in the beginning, how does a, a microscopic change have impact uh, in a macro way in cities and in, in atmospheres even. And what, what I'm seeing is this shift away from our resources coming from below ground to above ground. Um, but that doesn't necessarily indicate a change in permanence. I think in, in some examples you have biodegradability, in other biological examples you have circularity, endless circular chains. And I think that's, it's a question how we want to live. Um, I think the materials will support uh, a societal change. And I don't think that we have to uh, use petroleum or other fossil resources to do it. I think this is, uh, it's a question, I think of the psychological impact, I can just say that um, personally I find, the, I find the change to biological to be healthier. I think the idea of origin has come up in the last 10 years around materials, so there's a definite ethics attached to the materials. There's a question attached to the spaces that we live in. We're maybe moving out of an age where we just accept economies of scale and the, the delivery of finished parts. So this is, a, I would speculate that we're entering a time where we are, as individuals and communities, more involved in the, or co-creating in those spaces. Um, if there are, are there any more questions or comments? Uh, I know it's lunch time, so you're probably uh, eager to get there, but we could accept one. Yes, please. Yes, uh, hi. Uh, question to Seem. Uh, tell me about this uh, block you have uh, on the table. Uh, is this the same one we saw uh, three years ago in uh, Tab? You mean this block? Uh, this is this. It uses the same form that we usually use for the pavements. It's just to like showcase how easy it is to form it in any kind of shape. It is, yeah. It is lightweight. Um, so yeah, any, if anyone wants to have a touch or, or feel of the material, then track me down. Right, so prototypes, fascinating new materialities of uh, waste, biodegradability, carbon negativity, and climate positivity. Thank you very much for uh, uh, this uh, great discussion, and thank you for having us all here. And more during lunch. <laughs>